This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to Tau Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. And today, I'm very, very pleased and honored to host Professor Tova Milo. Welcome. Thank you. Tova is the Dean of the Faculty of For exact science we'll talk about that and she is a long time very successful very knowledgeable uh, world-renowned computer science professor so again welcome to our podcast the first question I have for you is please tell us a little bit about your background where you're from uh, a little bit about your upbringing um, I grew up in Natania uh, by the beach I spent most of my childhood in uh, swimming going to the beach not that much attending school uh, but it worked out eventually and when you were growing up in Natania was there any connection in the way you were brought up to what you're doing today absolutely nothing <laughs> absolutely nothing so you grew up uh, like uh, most uh, Israelis at the of, at the time you Uh, very much connected to the environment connected to the beach uh, you know children in those days spent a lot of time outside yes right exactly but it, it did stimulate your curiosity uh, it's hard to say uh, I was a really good student uh, at school uh, I got really high grades in everything and uh, I didn't really know what I want to do but And that's actually a funny story uh, when I was at uh, ninth grade I think uh, we had to choose uh, what to major in I had no idea what I want to do and then uh, the break at school uh, I was discussing with my girlfriends and uh, they didn't know also what I want to do and we decided to do something to go study something that we're all good at uh, just so that we'll be together and we decided to go and study a uh, literature and Uh, and linguistics <laughs> and at that time I had a boyfriend and at the end of the day uh, I went to him and I told him hey uh, that's what I decided to do and he looked at me and he said absolutely no way you are really really smart you have to go and study math and physics I was at that time really obedient <laughs> and I did uh, that's no longer the case and <laughs> I did what my boyfriend told me and I went back to my girlfriends and told them sorry uh, I'm going to study math and physics and that's what I did and uh, so, I love so, it <laughs> so this boyfriend changed the course of your life absolutely and I thank him actually until today you were still friends uh, and so so you went to you studied mathematics and uh-huh. uh, as we call as we used to To say in in Hebrew in those days it was the the real science right <laughs> the alley the real yeah. science and um, and and when was your first encounter with the world of computers um, so I actually started to study uh, the technion electrical engineering I knew nothing about computers and in the first year that you study uh, then uh, you have a uh, I had a programming uh, course uh, and at that time uh, the way you used to program was uh, there was this big machine uh, that uh, you went to you typed your program uh, you put it on a disk then you went and lunch and gave it to someone to launch it and then they would return it to you with errors and you would go back and type it again and go and so on and typically that that was like few nights you uh, Uh, that you had to do that and then we got the first exercise in the uh, at the course I went to the uh, computer room I typed my program I submitted it and it ran the first time and then I told myself this is something I'm really good at and I switched to computer science major so, so this is by accident actually so but but you felt that that you had the talent yeah yeah I think it was like I felt that that's that was something I'm uh, I'm really really good at so obviously a lot has changed yeah. in the world of computers since you first started to work with computers what would you say are the main things that have not changed in terms of the way we use computers in our society I 
not sure. I, I think everything changed in the way we use computers. Uh, I think, uh, but if you want to think about computer science education, uh, how you teach people uh, to program or to be computer scientists, I think uh, that what has not changed is the fact that the main thing that we teach people is not really programming languages or, or specifics uh, of one technology or another, but rather how to think. And and I think this is something that is time resilient, okay? Uh, because technology, uh, computers, computers technology changes all the time. And what's really important in order to stay uh, up to date and so on is the ability to uh, keep learning, understanding and so on. So the most important thing to teach students is how to think, how to learn. And in your case, yeah. in your case, when was it when you discovered how to think about computers? I think in my undergrad, uh, I think it's it kind of opens uh, a whole new world of different way of thinking about uh, problems very methodically, algorithmically, uh, very in an abstract manner and uh, not really dealing with the details, but rather having a big picture of what is needed. And I think this is very useful for... So in terms of your academic career, what's your main concentration? Uh, I'm a data management for, um, person. Uh, I study things that are related to data. So I think now uh, everybody understands that data is uh, the new oil. Okay, uh, uh, everything... Uh, that you want to do depends on the data that you have. If you have a lot of data, you can analyze it, you can learn many things. And that's my specialty, data management. And, and in, that, in data management, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge today? So is it just the volume of the data or the eclectic nature of the information that we collect? I think both of them are a problem. Um, I, I think we really have a huge flood of information and uh, we are at a point uh, where we cannot really handle everything. Um, so one of the big challenges uh, today is actually it's the opposite, is getting rid of data, trying to understand what in this ocean of information is important, what is essential, how to collect it, uh, how to clean it, how to... Uh, uh, make it relevant. Uh, and, and, so and obviously this has applications in almost every realm of life. If I remember correctly, I read somewhere mm -hmm. that the U.S. intelligence had the information about Al-Qaeda's plans mm -hmm. to attack uh, the United States on 9-11, but they only got to it three weeks after the attacks. Yeah. So here's a perfect, example. Pers a perfect yeah. example of, of oversaturation mm -hmm. of information. Now, there are ethical issues related to the ability to collect information. I remember when the Cambridge Analytics uh, debacle, uh, you know, happened with Facebook, that they were bragging about their ability to collect 5,000 data points on each user. Data point is a certain interest a certain visit or a certain site if you're interested in diabetes that it means that you have some curiosity about it it has commercial mm -hmm. applications today they tell me that they can collect up to 50,000 data points mm -hmm. um, do you see any 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 problems with the with this ability from an ethical point of view and if so what do you think should be changed so there are two things. One is what data is collected. And the second thing is what is done with the data that is collected. And these two things are related, but uh, can also be studied independently. So there are some things that you don't want to be collected on you. And you should have the right to say, I don't want anyone to have this information. But even if you give uh, permission to collect data on you, the question is what is allowed to be done with this data. What are you allowing and what is important? And I think uh, the world is advancing towards regulation in both uh, directions. There are already uh, uh, certain uh, laws that are imposed, but the technology is, uh, is uh, advancing extremely fast. And I think the law and the regulations should advance as fast uh, uh, with them. I just read in the newspaper uh, there was... Uh, 
a new verdict related to uh, whether artists have the right uh, uh, to tell uh, uh, companies that they use machine learning, not to apply the machine learning on their uh, art. Uh, or paintings or whatever uh, to generate new uh, new paintings. So, you know, this is not personal information. These are paintings or pictures that uh, are available on the web. But the question is uh, whether someone can use this thing in order to generate something else. And that's something that has to be uh, defined by law. What are the rights of the artists? What are the rights of people? And so on. And obviously there's the philosophical aspect of of, of Reproduction. Yeah. Um, what What is the meaning of, of reproduction? Who has the rights to reproduce work that was done by someone else? And um, and and it leads to another very big question in in your world of of data management and and, and data collection, and that is if in the old days we worked vis a vis. A human being. Let's say when we picked up a copy of a newspaper, there was someone, a human being, that decided for us what's important, what's not. Yes. What's going to be the front page headline. Today, we're working vis-a-vis -vis an algorithm. And mm -hmm. that creates a whole new set of problems. Uh, and again, very similar to what you mentioned, to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, what do you think is going to happen with that? Uh, I know that there's a whole movement of people trying to be very critical and express their criticism of the tyranny of the algorithm. Uh, look, we can criticize whatever we want. This is the future. Okay, this will happen. Uh, so the only question is uh, how are we going to deal with it? How uh, are we going to make sure that it affects our life in a positive way and not... Uh, or at least as little as possible in a negative way, uh, how to put boundaries where they should uh, should be put. I think fighting against it is like, uh, you know, fighting having electricity. Okay, electricity is here, it will stay, it's very useful, and we're using it. And I think artificial intelligence, you know, we, it's the same. Okay, it's not perfect yet, it's advancing, uh, and it will be here. And for our, our viewers and our listeners that are not savvy when it mm -hmm. comes to computer science. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what are the main principles of it? And let's talk about the positives. What are the things that we can do for the benefit of, of the humankind uh, using computers and artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence really, uh, you know, very abstractly, I think, uh, is the possibility uh, uh, to imitate some sort of inference uh, or I would say thought in some sense. Uh, uh, typically it is done by looking, at least today it is done by looking at information, the data that uh, exists on the web uh, or anywhere else and trying to learn from it uh, to derive uh, new insights uh, and so on. And it's to a level that uh, it can already do some not all the tasks that we can do, definitely not, but many of the things, uh, at least the, the less complicated things uh, in a reasonable way. The, I think that the, the recent, the most recent uh, uh, invention that people are discussing uh, about is something which is called the GPT-3. Um, it's a language model. Well, it's it's a software with which you can uh, uh, interact, ask questions, get answers, ask the software, uh, I don't know, to write articles for you, uh, to um, design speeches, to answer uh, even mathematical questions. Not very complicated yet, but, uh, but still it can do many things uh, that you could do. So one can view it as a big threat uh, that it will replace us in uh, writing essays or answering uh, things or, or doing, doing things that we can do. But we can also view it as something that can help us and do the things that we don't want to do uh, or do them even better than, than we can. So uh, I think it's a matter of trying to... Um, well, soon we will be at the point that we'll have to uh, reposition uh, uh, ourselves, ourselves so that we will be still productive uh, together with this kind of software rather than uh, saying, no, uh, this is a threat. Question is about 
creativity, can human creativity be duplicated by computers? Ah, uh, nobody knows. Uh, so I think people believe that not. I'm not that certain. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to uh, it's hard to tell. At this point, no, but uh, five years from now. Because I have no idea. Because you know people in the and, and that's the biggest fear of people in the creative uh, fields. And by the way, when I say creativity, I don't necessarily refer just to creativity in popular culture, which means people in the arts usually. Uh, I think that you're a creative person mm -hmm. in what you do, and you can find people, creatives, uh, creative minds in the labs, in the army, in in all walks of life, in politics. There, there's creativity everywhere we go, certainly in the kitchen, uh, certainly on the dance floor. There's creativity wherever we go. And one of the big elements is the ability to think randomly. Creative mind is the mind that can create connections that are not mm -hmm. obvious to most of us. That's what makes them creative people. And the question is if we can teach computers to do that randomly. I don't have the answer for that. I hope that uh, there will still be a room for uh, what we can do and they will not be able to do. But answering that, uh, you know, I don't so, know. So let me ask you a question about the future. And, and again, feel free. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any prediction, that's mm -hmm. fine. We, this is a friendly conversation. So it seems like um, that we're going to a future where most jobs, as we know them, Will not be ex will not be in existence because they will be replaced by algorithms or computers. For example, we walk into the emergency room in the hospital rather than being examined by uh, a, a physician. We will we could be examined by a computer, and the the results will be very accurate. Uh, so life expectancy is going to be you know my unborn grandchildren will live to be ninety five on average, right? And and people will be born into a world, right? We're, we're being told that by 2050, it's going to be 10 billion people in the world. Mm -hmm. 10 billion people with no jobs, with life expectancy well into their 90s. Uh, what kind of future in terms of work, in terms of um, leisure activities, can we expect? Uh Look, we've been here already. Uh, there was the industrial revolution uh, at some point where people uh, thought that, uh, you know, all the jobs that uh, uh, that existed will be taken by machines. Uh, there were these were simpler machines. Uh, these were these were not AI based computers, but uh, there was a fear. And we managed to find uh, other things that uh, that we can do that those machines could not do. Uh, on the other hand, it freed a lot of time for us to do things that we really enjoy. We don't have to uh, wash by hand uh, laundry. We don't have to work uh, in a factory folding, uh, uh, folding things. We can do things that are more uh, uh, intelligent. We have more free time uh, and so on. Uh, so I think the hope is that the current revolution... Uh, will have the same effect of our lives, that we will find things, uh, uh, other things to do, uh, that the things that will be uh, uh, replaced by uh, machines will leave us more time uh, to enjoy uh, uh, whatever products those machines will uh, will generate. So I view it in an optimistic way. I'm uh, kind of certain that, uh, well, at least I hope that we will find our way, that we will find uh, um, other things uh, that we are good at. Maybe creativity, if machines will not uh, be that. Uh, maybe just enjoying, you know, if everything will be done by, uh, by machines and food will be generated by machines and everything will be great, then uh, we'll just have to entertain ourselves. I don't know. It's hard to say. So maybe, but maybe the purpose of life, if I hear you correctly, if I understand between the lines, mm -hmm. the purpose of life will be in the future, the acquisition of knowledge. For instance, uh, yes. People, just like in ancient Greece. Yeah. So it's hard to say. I think it's a revolution. I mean, it's really, uh, we are at, uh, I think it's a wonderful point in time to live in uh, where Absolutely. things are really exciting. Things Absolutely. are changing. Uh, uh, and this is great. And uh, yes, there is always when something changes, there is fear. 
but uh, I view it more optimistically. I think. Uh, well, it's a, a it's a, it, I'm sure it's it's comforting to many people that are yeah. hearing us right now, that are listening to this podcast and are watching us on online to hear this from you. Now, let's shift a little bit to your work. So tell us about your faculty. How? What's the structure of the faculty? What are the main areas of concentration? Uh, so I'm the dean of the Faculty of Exact Sciences, uh, which is composed of five schools, the School of Mathematics, Computer Science, Physics, Chemistry, and Environmental uh, Studies. And um, these are really uh, amazing uh, schools, uh, in terms of quality, uh, both in terms of research and education. Uh, we have amazing students, uh, faculty members that are top researchers, uh, well-known all around the world. Um, it's great to be the dean of that faculty. Can you tell us a little bit more about the international collaboration of your faculty with the world? Uh, so I think all schools uh, have very tight collaborations uh, all around the world with Europe, uh, with the, the U.S., uh, you know, South South America, uh, Far East. Uh, and actually, I think research in exact science is, uh, is extremely international. Uh, every piece of uh, results that you have uh, is immediately uh, distributed and you know collaborated with uh, with other people so in, in that sense it's very international uh. now if there's i'm sure there are many many projects that scientists are developing right now as as we're sitting here that you're very proud of <laughs> but try to give us a couple of examples of things that would spark the imagination of our audience, things that are happening in your faculty right now. Uh, this is I'm not I ref, I'm re, I refuse. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm. Uh, you don't I, go into specifics. You can just give us a general idea. Yeah, so I refuse because, you know, uh, there are so many amazing projects that, uh, you know, there is no way I can enumerate uh, everything. And, you know, I don't want to insult anyone. Uh, and then uh, people will tell me, why did you tell about that? <laughs> not uh, Okay, that's fair enough. That's and, fair enough. And not and, the other. So I think... Uh, but in terms of, of the areas of concentration, so for example, you mentioned the environment. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, is, is con of concern to people is because of the fact that Israel is in the middle of this seemingly endless geopolitical event, let's call it, you know, the unhappy circumstances of the Middle East, I call it. Um, the environmental agenda is not part of the public discourse in Israel. We've had five election cycles. No one is talking about the environment. Um, where do you see the academic world in putting this item on the agenda of the Israeli public? I think in general, uh, the academic world has importance in putting things on agendas uh, uh, in general, you know, uh, and this is one of them. And uh, there are two, again, there are two ways to do that. One is by education. I think uh, the fact that, <clears throat> that we educate the younger generation uh, teach them what is important, how how to handle it, uh, and so on. Just a second. <laughs> it's very important. And um, and they will carry it further. So I think that's one important uh, thing. And the second thing is uh, really speaking up. You know, uh, not just in scientific... Um, uh, meetings and so on, but really uh, writing papers that are more popular in a sense, uh, interviewing uh, and so on, being on media uh, and and pushing as much as possible. Making it more accessible, <clears throat> yeah. accessible to the public. And, yeah, uh, I, I think ma making research accessible is important, not only uh, for environment. I think in general, uh, if you ask someone what does a mathematician do, they don't know and they don't understand what why mathematics is important or why physics is important or why chemistry is important. 
I think in general, making uh, science accessible is an important mission. I think mathematics is, is, a, is a tough mm-hmm. one to explain to people. I, I, I can see how people understand chemistry. They can understand how physics is important to their, relevant to their daily lives, but they have a tough time with... with yeah, I, I agree. But still, I think... Uh, Uh, this is one of the things where uh, people don't understand and things that people don't understand they don't think is important right and, right. and that's something that should be corrected now in in terms of, of your job what would you like to happen to have happened in, in in the next let's say five to ten years in your field that will make you feel good about your work and You mean in computer science in general or yes. in my own research? Uh, in your own research and in general. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, today, let's talk first about my own uh, research, research viewpoint. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm dealing with data, okay? And I think, Uh, since data is so important uh, uh, today if you look at, the, at the, a, any project that is uh, uh, um, created today people spend I think uh, something like 70% uh, of the time and energy and money on data preparation okay getting the data cleaning the data uh, integrating it doing things with it before you can do anything before you can use it. Okay, and this proportion of 70% versus 30% of usage is bad in a sense. Uh, and, and I think the big mission is really automating and, and making much faster all this part of, of collection of data. And that's kind of the mission uh, that is... So, so what you're saying is that when we're searching for something online, we're not actually scanning online. All the information that exists no it has been prepared for you uh, there has been a lot of processing uh, uh, before that that makes the data accessible and this processing is extremely heavy can you can you give us some sense of the size of the world of data that, that, that was created by by the humankind in in the you know since the introduction of the internet? Ah, uh, that's... Uh, you don't have to give exact numbers, just the, the general scope of things. Uh, okay, so, so if you take, uh, if you take uh, uh, Blu-ray discs, okay, the discs that people, the flat ones, the round ones that people used to, uh, uh, used to use uh, many years ago and you want to put all the information, uh, you know, one disc over uh, uh, another, you go to the moon and back something like 20 times. Oh my God. Okay, so it's a lot. Uh, a lot so, of information that, yeah. that, that we're... That we're Producing every yeah. day, yes. right? When we yes. take pictures on our cell phone, when we yes. send a text message, yeah. this is and, all information. And this number is growing, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it you know, doubles as we speak. I mean, it, it's really, really, uh, really big. And, and uh, there is an estimation that by 2025, uh, it will be 10 times the storage that we have. Okay, like... So we, the, we were unable we to are store. unable to store the, the amount of information that we generate so unless we learn how to decide which data is important and which data is not then you know we'll just throw away data that might be extremely useful now what's the new frontier uh, in data storage I, I hear that quartz is is a big solution. Uh, so there are many uh, uh, many advances on on how to store data more uh, compactly and uh, 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 and so on but even with all these these advantage these advances uh, 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 the the amount of storage that can be generated by companies I mean it grows also uh, uh, very high but again not as high as as uh, As, as the, the uh, information that, that we have I think it's uh, um, so so again looking 2025 uh, I think uh, the, the it will be I think 
the, the amount of information is affected to be something like 30 times the, the size of storage. Okay, so available. So there is no way to uh, right. And to of handle course, things. in yeah. the future, one of the big challenges will be to translate, quote unquote, and adapt the database from one system to another. For example, when you think about, you know, people tens of thousands of years ago left their mm -hmm. civilizational knowledge on the wall of the cave yes. they lived in, and we are going to leave a disk. All the civilizational backup disk will be maybe on, you know. Yes. That, and the question is, if 100 years from now, the person who will hold your job 100 years from now uh, will be able to understand that that's civilizational a, that's database. A, that's a good question. So there's a lot of research that is done uh, uh, on how to uh, preserve information, uh, how to really, exactly what you're saying, map from old storage to new storage, uh, how to archive uh, things. But that also takes storage. So part of the storage that we have uh, is kept for that, which leaves even less for a new new. Uh, uh, new data. So again, it's a question of choice eventually uh, of what you can keep, what you cannot uh, and making it in a wise uh, manner. Now, same question about computer science in general. So we spoke about data management and, uh, and I think that you gave us a very clear direction as to what's the most important thing and we need to be able mm -hmm. to sort you know, distinguish what's important, mm -hmm. what's not, and develop technologies that will allow us to store all this huge amount of information. Computer science in general, and I know we, we've had previous uh, guests in our podcast that talked about quantum computing, and I know that that's one, one area that is uh, developing. It's like a, a new buzzword. Mm -hmm. uh, but where do you see the future of computer science? Uh so here again, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, intelligence uh, uh, comes in because uh, it's not even clear that uh, the job that we're doing today as computer scientists, meaning programming, uh, would still be relevant because today, uh, even today, you can ask uh, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence agent to write a program for you. So uh, uh, I think the the job of a computer scientist uh, will become probably different uh, than what it is today. Uh, and it's not clear exactly uh, uh, where it will go. I think it will be more uh, in the sense of how to use uh, all these uh, intelligent uh, uh, assistance uh, uh, that we have rather than actually doing some of the more simple jobs uh, uh, that we have. And, and I think quantum computing is an example for uh, a completely different way of, uh, uh, of running uh, uh, software which might enter and, and kind of mix, be mixed with that. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's very hard to predict. Well, obviously... Um, it's very difficult to make predictions, mm -hmm. especially about the future. <laughs> yes. As Yogi Berra said, you know, yeah. Yogi Berra was a, mm -hmm. a baseball player who was famous for saying those nonsensical things. One <laughs> of the things he says, very, di very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Yeah. Uh, but I think that you are optimistic. Am I correct? Absolutely. And yes. So I think this, it's very important to be optimistic. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, and especially when when you're um, when you're having when you're holding such an important job in such an important university, and you're producing so many great scientists that will hopefully one day make the world a much better place than it is today. And I think that's a that's a great yes. privilege, and it's a privilege to interview you, and it's Thank a privilege to host you in our studio. And I wanted to thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. And I wanted to thank our viewers and our listeners for being with us. Until the next episode, goodbye from Tel Aviv. Goodbye. This is Tau Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat.